take every opportunity given to you. You never know what's going to come up. Um, you may absolutely hate it, but that's one of the um, benefits of trying everything. You learn what you like to do, what you're good at, what you don't like to do, what you're awful at. And I think that's really important. You meet people along the way. You meet mentors, um, colleagues, and it's all adds up. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Hey, this is your host, Matt Breckwald. This is episode number 1196, and you are tuned in for one of our recap episodes, everybody. Well, today we are going back to 2018, episode number 452, when I interviewed Miss Elizabeth Watkins, who at that point in time was going to high school at Central Catholic High School in Modesto, California. Now, Elizabeth was doing incredible things. Uh, She was driving all the way from Modesto up to Sacramento to do television shows, cooking shows like on the noon lunch hour and things like that for the television networks located in Sacramento. And she was really propelling herself out there in terms of what she was able to do through FFA, through her time uh, working with recipes and creating just really, really good things to eat, competitions in New York City, just incredible, incredible things. And tomorrow on our Friday episode this week, we are profiling a a woman who I think was probably, uh, even if Elizabeth didn't know it, probably uh, forging this path ahead of her uh, in supporting her family's farm in Kansas through doing whatever she could do, namely becoming a very, very successful Tupperware salesman, or salesperson, I should say. And I never, ever expected to profile that business here on the show. But man, have I got a phenomenal story for you tomorrow of driving all around the state of Kansas in Nebraska, putting on Tupperware parties and supporting the family farming business. And I felt like Elizabeth's episode would fit in very, very nicely. Uh, as a recap episode leading up to tomorrow's episode with Rosie Bossy. So we are going to replay episode number 452 featuring Elizabeth Watkins for you today, and we're going to get that started for you right now. Joining me today is Elizabeth Watkins, and she's coming to us from her home in Linden, California. Elizabeth is a senior at Central Catholic High School in Modesto, California, and has a very interesting SAE to talk about us coming up here in just a moment. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for coming on. Hi. Well, thank you for having me on your show. Hey, you bet. I am uh, happy to speak with you and and looking forward to... well, I would say looking forward to introducing you to uh, to the world, but I think you've already done that yourself. But we'll talk more about that here coming up in just a second. Uh, do you mind if I start off by just asking you a few questions about you uh, to help introduce you to my audience? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Well, how old are you now, Elizabeth? I am 17 years old. All right. And I said that uh, you're a senior in high school, but of course, at the time we're recording this, you're a junior, but by the time this is coming out, uh, you are going to be, well, you're going to still be a junior, but very close to a senior. Yes. Okay. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, it's, it's your chance to run that school, to operate that school. You'll be in charge, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Now, uh, when when you're not at Central Catholic, when you're at home in Linden, are you on a farm, a ranch, uh, in town, or something kind of in between? I live on both a farm and a ranch. Surrounding my house is a beef cattle ranch where we have a commercial cow-calf operation, and I have a few of my own registered shorthorn animals, as well as a steer that I raise for the county fair and some turkeys. And then uh, outside of the ranch, we have walnuts, almonds, peaches, cherries, uh, and we grow hay. I love it. I love it. Now, just to paint the picture for everybody, um, you live in Linden. You go to Central Catholic High School. Now, I have some friends who did this when I was a kid as well, um, but Central Catholic is in, well, it's in the older part of Modesto, California. How far is your drive to school? I have a lovely 45-minute commute one way. Um, it makes for a 70-mile round trip each day. <laughs> wow. Okay. So people out there right now are going, why in the world would anyone commute this far to school? And you've got a really interesting answer. Go ahead and tell us why. 
Exactly. My brother, I have a brother who's three years older than me, and he went to Linden's Public School, but he's like, you know what, Elizabeth, there's bigger and better things out there. And so I started exploring different schools, different private schools, and I came across Central Catholic, um, which is, of course, in Modesto, but um, my eighth grade year was the first year that Central Catholic uh, gained its FFA charter as well as started their program. So I could enter my freshman year and go through four years of agriculture education courses, and that was what sealed the deal. It's a pain, the drive, the commute, but when I look at the end goal, I know that I'm going to be ahead. I'm going to have that great private school education and the friends and the family, but still have that agriculture and FSA background. Yeah, I mean, it's really something to listen to you tell the story because you looked at other private schools, right? But uh, you you specifically went out of your way to go to Central Catholic because they had the FFA. Exactly. There was one uh, in Stockton, which is 10 or 15 minutes closer to my house, but uh, they did not have FFA, so um, that was the deciding factor. Okay, very awesome. And, and when we talk about Linden, uh, you are, you're east of Stockton, California, just on the, the kind of the beginning of the foothills there in the San Joaquin Valley, right? Of course, yes. Yeah, you know, I uh, as we talk with you, it, it's funny how things happen. So I, I've wanted to raise cattle since I was about sixteen years old, sixteen or seventeen, and of course that all started for me uh, in the in the San Joaquin Valley, not a, not very far from you. But uh, now I I have my own farm and I have cattle in Idaho, which is great. I love Idaho, but it's a funny feeling that I get when I drive through the foothills and through areas like Linden and Farmington and in Eugene and in these areas coming down from the foothills in California and and see the cattle that are running out on rangeland out there uh knowing that that's the original vision I had I get a get a warm feeling when I when I go through places like where you get to live oh very nice yeah yeah, yeah very cool okay so I normally ask students how long they've been in the FFA, but we know already you've completed three years, and that is very much on purpose. Uh, you you sought out a school uh, that could offer you both things that you were looking for, that, that private school education and, and some of those opportunities you were looking for, but in addition to that, FFA. Now, I want to ask you, why was being a member of the FFA so important for you that you went out and did your research and found a school that would accomplish that? Both of my parents are heavily involved in the agriculture industry. Um, my dad, of course, is a farmer. He served as a officer on the California Farm Bureau uh, Federation Board. And uh, my parents are actively involved in agriculture education. So I knew that this is something that my family had a background in and that I thought I had um, an opportunity and a calling to agriculture education. So I thought, well, the FFA would be a good next step after 4-H. I'm still a 4-H member, but I wanted something more, something Mm -hmm. uh, to bring me back to that agriculture. And so when I joined the FFA, I immediately started um, in all the speaking competitions, the CDE competitions, and uh, fell in love with the program. And my favorite aspect of it is you get... Um, out of it what you put in so uh, we just had our FSA banquet and I must have walked up to the podium 15 times to get recognized for things that I've done just this school year and I think that's really important and it's helped me to grow as a person an individual and a leader within today's society Yeah, that's really nice, and it's nice to get that recognition. Hey, everybody, just a quick break from this recap episode to talk about our great sponsors. Of course, I am referring to Lacrosse Footwear. You can find their entire line of boots and other products at lacrossefootwear.com. Done right since 1897. Lacrosse Footwear has been making quality boots for hunting, working, and tending the land for over a century. And, of course, we're always very proud to bring them up because we use their boots here on our farm. Bought them with my very own money, and I'm still wearing my very first pair. I'm well into year three on that very first pair of Alpha Range Chore Boots. You guys, they work just as hard as you. Mine haven't ripped. They haven't leaked. They haven't cracked. They haven't broke down, and I wear them every single day of the year. We want your money to go just as far as mine has. Find their entire line at lacrossefootwear.com and make the switch today, everybody. Well, speaking of making your money go far, how about the lifetime, almost multi-generational investment 
of Powder River livestock handling equipment. I'll tell you what, we've got their livestock panels and a squeeze chute from Powder River here on our farm for working our cattle. Bought those with my own money well before Powder River was a sponsor of the show. And every time we have to work cattle, it fills me with confidence. Now, Powder River has been with us for years now. They are a great sponsor, but they have been with all of you, all of you folks who want to raise cattle. They have been with all of you for well over 80 years out here in the West with some of the toughest cattle we have to handle. They are producing unbelievably quality equipment to get that job done. You can find their entire line of products over at PowderRiver.com. And hey, please let your local farm and ranch retailer know you want to see that Powder River Green out in their sales yard so you can also have the finest in livestock handling equipment. All right, let's get back into this great recap episode. I'm picturing the conversation between you and your parents when you said, yeah, I want to I want to go to school all the way down in Modesto uh, <laughs> to be a part of the FFA chapter. And, and I'm just picturing this. I'm sure this is not how it went. And them going, oh, well, if you're going that far, you better earn it. And oh, my goodness, have you? Uh, you've done some extraordinary things. Can you talk to us about what you've been doing for your supervised agricultural experience? Yeah. So I wanted to do something different, and I kind of have a unique start. Um, in 4-H, I would turn nine years old, and I um, joined the program and the cooking project where I learned to cook, and I developed my love for cooking and you know, recipe testing and coming up with something good to eat. And that led me to Food Network's Chop Junior Kitchen, where I was uh, crowned the Chop Junior Champion and got a nice, lovely check along with that. And so I built on my love for cooking and used it as a platform for agriculture education. So since I started FSA my freshman year, I've done cooking lessons in agriculture education through um, teaching people how their food is grown, where their food comes from, a local seasonal ingredients. I'll make a recipe, and I will um, either do, like, classroom presentations to students. Um, I've done fundraising dinners. I have done several TV segments as well as radio, print news Uh, magazine articles. So I try to get the message about agriculture education and that farmers are nice people and we want to feed the world and we do feed the world. Awesome. Very, very cool. Okay. So I've got to ask, I I totally understand getting into cooking and doing that in 4-H. Actually, that's a path my daughter seems to be on. Um, She shows sheep every year in 4-H, but now all of a sudden she's baking these desserts all the time. It's uh, it's it's both good and bad at the same time. I'm sure you know what I mean. <laughs> but but uh, but the jump from that to being in a competition on the Food Network, how does that happen? So one day I was watching TV with my mom. Chopped was on Food Network, and they gave frisee, which if you don't know, it's kind of it's a green. Sometimes they put it in your salad, and it looks like a weed. Um, that, that was a mystery basket item, and they made some awful sauce with it. And I looked at my mom, and I said, I would have done this. I can cook better than that person. So um, my mom's like, well, maybe you should go on the show. So I found an application for a casting uh, for Food Network for some junior kid cooking competition. Didn't mm-hmm. really know what it was. Filled out the application mostly without my parents knowing, and two weeks later I get a phone call from the Food Network saying, hi, we'd like to interview you on Skype. (laughs) Wow. And long story short, after the casting process, my parents and I were flown to New York City to the studio above Chelsea Market for filming. Oh, my goodness. How old were you at this point? I was 15 years old. Wow. And now, had you ever been to New York City before? Yeah, I had been several times, um, and after that experience, I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm done with New York. Take me back somewhere else. I can't do the big city. (laughs) Yeah, compared to Linden, that is a whole world apart, isn't it? (laughs) Yep, definitely. Incredible. So, was there one thing in particular that you cooked to win this competition, or was it a series of things over time? So, the competition is 
three courses. It's an appetizer, a main entree, and a dessert. And after each time, uh, they cut one person. So we start off with four contestants, mm -hmm. and by the dessert round, it's just two. I think my dessert is really what won me over. Um, I made a dehydrated cheese and french fry crumble with a raspberry and passion fruit compote and cinnamon sugared apples. Um, so we got really wacky ingredients, but um, it all came together okay. So. <laughs> wow. I can't, uh, there's no way I could repeat that, but I know I could eat that. So that sounds, well, I know it's got to be, un got to be incredible. That's got to be awesome. Wow. I that is incredible. So you, you come back from that, and then that launches you into all these different uh, ag communications projects uh, advocating for agriculture through cooking. Exactly. When I came back, my mom's old uh, PR friend in the Sacramento area um, took a liking to me. Um, I was doing vegetable carvings, and how to make an omelet was one of my 4-H presentations. And mm -hmm. so he just started getting me on local television in Sacramento, and we're lucky enough here where I live, I'm only about an hour from Sacramento, and it's the 20th media market in the nation, so it's a pretty large market, so I've had the opportunity to be on um, KCRA 3, Good Day Sacramento, yesterday mm -hmm. I was on Fox 40, um, so I've had exposure to several different TV stations, and then um, many different radio shows. Um, so that's helped gain a following for me. Um, as I progress through my supervised agriculture experience, um, after my freshman year, I designed my own business cards. Um, just this year, I created my own website that also has a blog portion. It's farmgirlchef.us. Um, so I've been trying to expand myself and grow as an agriculture communicator. Absolutely. Wow. And how how are you using this platform to advocate for agriculture? So, like, give me an example of something that you would have said on Fox 40 uh, yesterday to, to advocate for ag. So, yesterday it was raining in California. I know. Imagine that rain. <laughs> and it's the middle of May, and it was pouring down. So, um, someone, the uh, reporter said, well, cherries aren't in season now. And I said, no, they're in season right now, you know, your sweet cherries. So when we got to this segment, I talked about how the weather, so the rain yesterday, the frost that we've had, has cut the crop down to a third. So I explained to the audience, you know, a smaller crop, um, the commodity value, some of the different um, varieties of cherries. And so just to give some basic knowledge and understanding to the consumer and tie it all together through a recipe. So now they have a reason why they should go to the grocery store, go to the farmer's market, purchase a bag of cherries, take it home, and then now they can make cherry mousse. And they have some basic knowledge and understanding of the cherry industry and the farmers that are a part of it. That's great. It is great to have somebody who understands not just where the food is coming from, but what goes into bringing that food to people be out there and be advocating for people on the other end because everybody wants to do the other end which is consume delicious food um <laughs> and it's it's good for them to understand that connection it just doesn't happen automatically right yeah and i'm lucky enough here living in california and with my family's farm and operation that we're so diversified even though my dad doesn't grow asparagus, mm -hmm. I know a guy 15 minutes down the road that is an empire, has an asparagus empire. And I can go up to him and say, hey, would you donate a box of asparagus so I can take it on TV and I can make this recipe and I can talk to consumers about what you do on your farm mm -hmm. and why they should buy your product. And they shouldn't go to the store and buy the um, asparagus from Mexico. It's important that they buy locally grown asparagus. And most of the time, the farmers are all for it because they're too busy doing their job, farming and growing the food to feed the world, mm -hmm. that they don't have enough time to go out and advocate um, to consumers and talk to them why their food is so important. So I like to do that job for them. Very cool. Well, that's wonderful. And, and you're right about that diversity. I, was, I just did an interview with a gentleman from Southern California just a few weeks back. 
and we were talking about where I grew up in Valley Home, so not far from from you. Mm-hmm. And when I grew up there, it was almost exclusively rice farming, and he had no idea we grew rice in California. And of course, around <laughs> Sacramento, we grow a ton of rice, and uh, so it, it is a very diverse area. Definitely. Really interesting. Now, for for somebody who's never been to an asparagus farm, and I've been, I, I got to work in agriculture in the San Joaquin Valley, but a uh, really interesting crop to watch it be grown. It's it's the most funky-looking, weed-looking thing. Uh, but uh, it's funny, I got up to Idaho. You're talking about asparagus farming. I got up to Idaho, and my wife and everybody else who grew up, up here, uh, they've never seen asparagus grown on purpose. They've always just picked it off of ditch banks and eaten it that way. So it's funny how it, funny how it works. Yeah. Really cool. Now, so are you driving to, each and every time you do one of these, are you driving to Sacramento, or can you do these uh, remotely from your kitchen in Linden? Most of the time, I drive up to the studio in Sacramento for TV. Sometimes radio, I can record an interview um, at my convenience, and they'll just play it. Mm Mm-hmm. But I like to be in the studio. I like to interact with the reporters. On a few occasions, we've had reporters come to the uh, packing shed where they've watched, you know, nut walnuts being cracked in mm-hmm. action and packaged and tr- uh, pickers actually picking the cherries off the trees. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, it is in the studio. Very cool. Awesome. Well, now, has this led at this point to proficiency awards and things like that through the FFA at the state level? I haven't yet applied for any proficiency awards, but I definitely have plans for next year to apply for the Agriculture Communication uh, Proficiency Award. I've just been working on building my uh, resume and all my activities that I've done. Within the next few weeks, I should have an article coming out in the FFA New Horizons magazine, as well as the um, Successful Farming magazine. Very, very cool. Incredible. Well, Elizabeth, where is this going to take you? So you've got a year of high school left and then on to the next step. What's going to happen next? My plan and my goal right now is to attend a four-year at a state university to study agriculture communication. I've looked into Purdue, Ohio State, and Oklahoma State University, um, I just want to get out of California, experience something else, um, look at agriculture in a different way mm-hmm. through a, a different perspective. Interesting. And what a diverse array of, of places to go. So Ohio, Indiana, and Oklahoma, uh, each of those places is going to offer its own unique look at, at how agriculture is, is conducted and gets done. Uh, so it doesn't matter which of those places that you go to, you're going to see something completely different. Exactly. Very cool. Well, good for you. Well, Elizabeth, what you've done is is incredible, especially considering your age and considering when you started and, and everything that you get to do now. I'm looking at your website right now. It's a really well done, nice website. Great photo of you right there on the, on the front page. If there's another student out there listening who they... I don't know, they get challenged by their mom or they get challenged by their their big brother or something like that that says, well, if you think you can cook so good, then you go be on this TV show. And they sit there and they go, yeah, right. You actually said, yeah, right, okay, I will. And you figured out how to do it and made it happen. What advice would you have for that student? Take every opportunity given to you. You never know what's going to come up. Um, You may absolutely hate it, but that's one of the... Um, benefits of trying everything. You learn what you like to do, what you're good at, what you don't like to do, what you're awful at. And I think that's really important. You meet people along the way. You meet mentors, um, colleagues, and it all adds up and you never know where you'll end up. So it's good to have all those opportunities and experiences under your belt. Awesome. Okay. I guess I should have asked this question. That, and by the way, that was great advice, Elizabeth. I should have asked this question before I did that. But I'm thinking about your future in ag communications, where you're going to college. Do you want to stay in front of the camera? Is that th- something you've got your eye on? I would love to stay in front of the camera. That's something that I um, really enjoy doing. And if I could 
get paid to do that, <laughs> um, to get consistent employment, that would be uh, definitely a career goal for me. Uh-huh. Now I know that that might not happen, so I have to, um, you know, kind of plan and figure out some different career paths as well. Awesome. Well, best of luck to you. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing this incredible story with us. Thank you for having me, Matt. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us here today on the Off Farm Income Podcast. We would love to connect with you. Uh, you can find us all over social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And hey, if that doesn't work for you, I would be just more than happy to get an email from you. You can email me at matt at offincome.com. And you can always call me on the telephone as well. The number is 888 597 55 Nine six, and everybody, as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture. Agriculture.